Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Kimberly Cloud Show. I'm your host, Kimberly Cloud. It's an honor to wear this shirt today that says Army. And I have an Egyptian symbol. Y'all remember that. I hold it everywhere. But I wanted to talk about a special event. It's very special to me to talk about a person's typically past, present, and future. But I wanted to introduce this doctor, you know, um, who has a father that is would have turned 98 today and served in the war. So um, can you go ahead and introduce yourself before we get started, who you are and where you are from? Sure. Hey, Kimberly. I, my name is Walt Laramore. I'm a family and sports medicine physician in Colorado, but grew up in Louisiana uh, with four brothers. Uh, I was one of four brothers. I have three brothers. And we grew up with a dad who we knew had fought in the war. We knew he had lost his leg, but he never talked about it. And I've come to learn through my research that many of the veterans of, of foreign wars don't talk about their experiences. I remember asking mom, how, why didn't he talk about it? And she said, he, he's just left all of that behind. But then Kimberly, on their 45th wedding anniversary, all us boys were gathered together, having a Cajun meal down there in Louisiana. And I guess he was just nostalgic or maybe he had one too many beers, but he just decided to start talking about his war experiences as the youngest officer in World War II and one of the most highly decorated officers in World War II. And as he shared story after story after story that, quite frankly, we did not believe. But in the research I've done since he passed away in 2003, I found that those unbelievable stories are, in fact, all true. And it's made an amazing book called At First Light. Now I'm intrigued. Tell me like two of those amazing stories to honor your dad. Well, I mean, the, literally the book is chock full of a hundred of them. It took 16 years of research, putting together 450 of his letters home, looking at history books that talked about the, the, the various stories. But of all the amazing stories of, of fighting alongside Dwight Eisenhower, of meeting Winston Churchill, of becoming friends with President Harry Truman, of recovering in a hospital with Audie Murphy, perhaps the most decorated soldier in World War II, I think the two that stand out the most to me. Uh, one was three days, a month before the end of the war. So he actually fought for 415 days of, of frontline, horrible fighting. He fought in a time when the average second lieutenant had a life expectancy on the front line of less than 30 days, and he survived 415. But uh, uh, one month before the end of the war, they had they had fought through Northern Africa. They fought into Sicily. They fought into Italy and then southern France. They had five D days, not one. They had five D days. And they fought, <laughs> fought up. Okay, through the we're going in history. Yeah. D day. Tell me about D day. You said I, five. I remember D day, but I don't remember. Wasn't that in Hawaii or something? Nobody, nobody remembers them. Everybody, when you say D day, they remember Normandy, right? D day. Yeah. The, that's the guys on the northern front. The guys on the okay. southern front had five. They had a D-Day in French Morocco. They had a D-Day in Sicily. They had a D-Day in Salerno, Italy. They had their fourth D-Day in Anzio, Italy. And then they had their fifth D-Day in southern France. The northern guys that landed at Normandy, they fought horrible, terrific battles for, for 336 days. The guys on the Southern Front fought for 913 days. In fact, when they broke out of Anzio to, to go liberate Rome in June of 1944, the 3rd Infantry Division that Dad fought in lost a 1,000 men that day. It was the most losses of any division in World War II. The 3rd Infantry Division had more medals of honor than any division in World War II. They fought in every country in North Africa and Europe that, that the U.S. Army fought in. And they are the forgotten front. That's what this book about is about, is the, 
is about the forgotten front. But I think one of the most amazing stories was a month before he lost his leg, uh, saving a patrol that was surrounded. Uh, he was an equestrian. So the book is full of, of, of horse stories, of war horse stories uh, that, are, that are amazing. But one month before the end of the war, he was called into the commanding general's office. And they told him that there were rumors that Hitler had gathered in Czechoslovakia all of the world's population of Lipizzan horses, the famous white dancing horses of Vienna, Austria, and that those horses were about to be destroyed by the invading Russian army. And they wanted to know, are those horses there? Or is that just, uh, you know, disinformation? So he flew 200 miles in a Cessna, little, a little Piper Cub plane, secret mission, landed in a forest clearing, and uh, traveled with a Nazi officer, a Nazi veterinarian, to go to this horse farm. And they found the Lipizzan stallions. And then he rode out back to the plane. They were able to escape out. Can, with the information. Can you stop it? What... What is a Lipizzan horse? So you may have seen pictures of them. They're these gorgeous white horses. They're called dancing horses. And in Vienna, Austria, at the at the Spanish Riding School, these horses are one of the biggest tourist attractions in the world, not just in Europe, not just in Austria. And Hitler, you know, remember, he wanted to make the master race, right? He wanted the Aryan race. And so he wanted to cleanse the world of what he considered impure humans, whether they were mentally defective or whether they were homosexual or whether they were Jewish. And so he killed literally millions of those people to have this pure race he called the Aryan race. And for the pure race, he wanted a pure horse. And so he had veterinarians, Nazi veterinarians, gather all of what are called the royal breeds of horses. So they were Andalusians and Berbers and quarter horses and thoroughbreds and Lipizzans. And he gathered them together. And then he decided this, this white purebred horse would become the perfect horse for the Aryan people. And he was breeding them uh, together. But the, they were beginning to lose. It was the end of the war. It was just before Hitler committed suicide. And the Russians who were coming into Czechoslovakia were killed because of the starvation in Russia. They were killing and eating every animal in their path. And so the Americans had heard that they had captured and killed 12 of these excuse me, 22 of these royal, magnificent horses. And so dad went in to find the rest of them, which he did. And then General Patton authorized an illegal operation called Operation Cowboy, where a cavalry, a cavalry group went into Czechoslovakia illegally, found the Lipizzans, and walked them through the mountains 120 miles to Austria, and saved the Lipizzans. It's a it's a wonderful, heart rending and heartbreaking story of bravery and courage. Wow, you know that is so cool. Like, what is so something that Hitler saw in these rare breed horses, which meant that he saw something within their blood, or something that was very different. I don't know. You know, this is a mad scientist or you, you see what I'm saying? Hitler was no. mad. He, 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 he went mad off of the wrong crystals. He made methamphetamine. He put people, wasn't he the one that put people in concentration camps too? Death camps. Yeah. Yeah. So um, not the down crystals. I, I found the positivity in them. I don't look at them in a negative way, you know, um, but, you know, this, this, this is sick. And, and everything you said about these horses, man, like it has to be the key to something. They got unicorns that, that they don't talk about. And these are rare breed. If he wants to breed them out, it's a reason. Maybe that that was what he was told to do. Who knows? I don't know. I could go on and then. <laughs> so do you have um, any other stories you, you wanted to explain about your book? Oh, a hundred of them. But I think the one that, the one that is most heartwarming, uh, he lost his leg. 
uh, going in on the back of a tank to, sh to rescue a patrol of his men that were surrounded by 150 Germans. And he was able to save uh, the entire uh, platoon, except one man was killed uh, in that battle of, of sh shooting a, a machine gun off of a tank, of being hit by bullets several times. He was hit twice in the head by sniper bullets. Uh, one one bullet he thought went through his hip because uh, he felt the blow of the bullet, and then he felt blood, this warm fluid rushing down his leg, and so he he turned from the machine gun to to undo his belt to put around his leg to try to save his life. And what he saw, what he saw was that the bullet had gone through his canteen and it was just warm water going down his leg. But just a few minutes later, a sniper shot him through the leg. He was evacuated, but lost his leg and was sent home where he recuperated uh, for, for one year. He went through recuperation. And during that recuperation, because he was an equestrian, a, a horse expert, he developed horse therapy for amputees that were were um, that were recovering as the first recorded incidents of, of horse therapy in the U.S. Army. Dad was part of that. But the story I wanted to tell you about was the, the policy of the U.S. Army in World War II was that if you were an enlisted soldier and you lost an arm or a leg, if you could find a job in the Army, you could stay in, but not for officers. If you were an officer and you lost an arm or a leg, you were considered less than human. You were considered no longer officer and gentleman material. And as soon as you were rehabilitated, as soon as you were fitted for a prosthesis, you were discharged. You were thrown out. You were discarded as unworthy to stay in the army. And my dad felt that that was. How did that make your dad? Uh oh, but you see, I'm I'm right with you, dude. Yeah. How did that make your dad feel? It made him feel awful. It made him feel less than human. In fact, it it, it led to a severe depression, and and he one felt of felt isolated, didn't he? Absolutely, it felt less than 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 a person, and and. I came to understand through his letters and his writings the value of chaplains uh, in taking care of soldiers. But at Lawson General Hospital in Atlanta, he, he met with a chaplain and he wrote his mother because he, he was feeling so low. And after confessing these feelings to, to an army chaplain, the chaplain sort of gave him a little, a little sermon. And this is what he wrote that the chaplain said. He said, uh, he, he wrote his mom. He said, Mom, the chaplain gave me this life-altering advice. He said, Son, your wound will either make you a bitter person or a better person. It will either harden your heart or it will soften it. You will either be a person changed for the worse or one who chooses to make the world better. In my opinion, the chaplain told him, the worst disability in life isn't being disabled. It's being disabled with a bad attitude. The Germans smashed your leg, but don't let them shatter your heart, your talents, your gifts, your will, or your faith in God and his plan for you. But he said, son, the choice is up to you. And that advice changed my dad. It changed his prayers. It changed his outlook. And he decided to begin to fight against this injustice, against this unfair policy. And it took him to Washington, D.C. It took him into a personal relationship with General Dwight Eisenhower. It took him into a personal relationship with President Truman. And it took him uh, into the offices of senators and representatives to fight this policy. And it finally ended up in an army hearing that was at Walter Reed uh, Hospital I've been uh, there. After after the war. And the most amazing thing of all was I actually found the transcript of that hearing in the National Archives up, up in Washington in College Park, Maryland. I couldn't believe it. It was, it was like finding an archaeological treasure. And I don't know if you remember, there was a movie that Tom Cruise and Jack Nicholson played in called A Few Good Men. And, and the main scene in that movie is where the, the lawyer played by Tom Cruise gets into a verbal fight with the general played by Jack Nicholson. And reading the transcript of my dad in front of those officers fighting for this injustice reads just like that movie. It's a 
remarkable, remarkable part of the book. Whoa. <laughs> wow, man. It, it, this is so cool because I, I get to learn about real life things going on with your book, like seriously. And, and, and this is not fake things. This is real life things. Mm -hmm. Um, it touches my heart, but it, 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 it kind of hardens my heart seeing as though they looked at your dad serving and then they, I don't want to cry on the camera, so I'm just going to let it be, but they, mm -hmm how can you look at somebody as less than a person because they got a disability whether leg extremity whether mental extremity you know you can work through that you know instead of spending all this money you know giving it to people that don't need it i feel that they should be working on better extremities to attach to the leg or maybe some type of beyond nanotechnology that can rebuild a leg, but they don't want to, or robots for the police, but they don't look at this type of technology. Instead, they said he's less than a person and they kicked him out, which was not correct. Uh, to me, it, it, it wasn't. The, well, the, the, right the good news it. is that although he did lose that battle and he was uh, discharged from, from the army. Uh, just a few years after that, as a result of his battle, the army changed its policy. And now we honor our disabled veterans. We honor our amputees. They not only are taken care of until they have a prosthetic, but until they have recovered mentally, they've recovered spiritually, they've recovered physically, they've recovered in their relationships with their with their family and their friends and, and their buddies. And then uh, our services find a role. They find- He created play. that through Congress. He, I mean, they had the army hearing because of your dad, right? Correct. That is crazy. I, I, I remember what you just said, but that is just so crazy that your dad helped build a part just a tiny inkling of many of the army system and 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 and, and oh my god it's an honor to talk to you like i said well it's a it's an honor to know him and to know of him uh, i think he would agree that with martin luther king that an injustice to any person or to any type of people is an injustice to all. And over 2 million men and women fought in Europe, not, not to conquer Europe, but they, they sailed from America. They sailed as young Americans to liberate Europe. Of course, it happened in the Pacific also, but to liberate Europe from fascism, from, from socialism, from, from injustice, from impurity, from prejudice. They fought and they gave their lives. In fact, dad would never, despite the fact that he was one of the most awarded uh, frontline soldiers in World War II, he had every medal that the army gives with the exception of the Medal of the Honor. He had a distinguished service cross. He had two silver stars. He had two bronze stars with valor. He was awarded seven Purple Hearts, but turned down three of them because he didn't think the wounds were bad enough. <laughs> You know, but he would say he was not a hero. He would say the men and women buried in Europe are buried in the Pacific. Those were the heroes because they gave all of their tomorrows for our todays. And in this time of, of great political divide and argument and, and, you know, he would say, we gave our lives, you youngsters, for your freedom, for your liberty. Don't abuse it, uh, cherish it, honor it, sit on our shoulders, walk in our shoes, but cherish what you have, freedom and liberty. And that's what they were, they were liberators. They went into Northern Africa to liberate uh, from Nazism. They went into Italy to liberate. In fact, the Southern Front guys liberated the first capital in Europe. They liberated Rome on June 4th and 5th, 1944. But nobody knows that because June 6, 1944, was D-Day in Normandy. And so all the headlines of freeing Rome were flushed for the headlines of 
of Normandy. We've forgotten the guys on this on the southern front. I guess and, and this book is to honor them. It's not just my dad's stories, as amazing as they are, but it's of all of those two million men and women who fought not only for us, but to liberate Europe from oppression. Do you still think Europe is oppressed in some countries in Europe? You know, I think we can't look at a country in the world, even our own, and not see <laughs> areas of the country and 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 people types, you know, that aren't oppressed. Uh, one of the 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 things that I most like about my personal spiritual faith is the theme of loving God and loving others. And I think to the extent that any people or any person can can live that and, and understand that and incorporate into their life, in my case as a physician, incorporating that into my practice of, of meeting people where they're at, uh, entering into their story where they're at, not to persuade or push them to go this particular way or that way, but rather just to walk with them and talk with them. In the case of dad and the forgotten front, it was a matter of entering into the battles of the people they were liberating. And then upon liberating them, upon freeing them to be sure that they had the resources that they needed to rebuild themselves, to rebuild their families, to rebuild their homes, to rebuild their cities and villages and hamlets, and to rebuild their country. So our country and the allied countries didn't just go in and win and conquer and then leave. They actually set a foundation for freedom that, although it's not perfect, uh, certainly I think is probably the best government form uh, that the world's ever seen. Is it flawless? Absolutely not. But it's what they fought for. Speaking of government, um, do you think that in the foreseeing future with the book you read and do would you like to see democrats and republicans actually working and independents and whoever else is down the line working together like actually being but because one day it's going to be something beyond them that that gets them in the end if they don't learn how to work together don't you think oh i i couldn't agree more i think the vast, it can't look at a poll done. The vast majority of Americans are looking at what's going on in Washington saying, are you guys crazy? <laughs> are you women, men and women crazy? Can't you just cross the aisle and, and talk? I was, I was, as a physician, I was invited by a former Surgeon General, David Satcher. Uh, David was the first African-American uh, Surgeon General. He served under Bush and Clinton, both both sides. And he, uh, each of our Surgeon Generals does a white paper on something that's important to them. And for him, it was the issue of human sexuality. And he was a very spiritual man. He grew up in a log cabin in Mississippi. The only book in the house was the Bible. And so he learned what he learned about human sexuality from, from the Bible early on. But he did a white paper on human sexuality with all of the information that was available scientifically about that. And he gathered together a group of 30 commissioners. I was one of the 30 people who came from every walk of life, every view of human sexuality that you can imagine was represented around that table. Groups that had very, very strong feelings about sexuality one way or another. And we were all very interested in what was he getting at? What did he want to do? So we met in Atlanta. I remember our first meeting with Dr. Satcher. He sat at the head of the table. He welcomed all 30 of us. And he said, each of you have very strong personal beliefs about human sexuality. We're not here to change those beliefs. He says, my charge to you is not to talk the other people in the table to believing what you believe. That's not my charge. He said, my charge to you is to figure out, is there anything you agree upon? Is there even one thing about human sexuality you agree upon? And, and it's got to be 100% of you that will agree on it. And it, whatever you agree on, let's, let's put that in writing so that policymakers will know that everything their constituents will agree upon. And if you can't find anything you agree upon, then I want you to define your differences 
clearly what are your differences and how can you work together? And I've got to tell you, it was one of the most wonderful, it was very difficult meetings. Facilitators came in and helped us, but it was wonderful to see people with such different beliefs, far left, far right, slightly left, slightly right, centrist, be able to get together, talk together, develop relationships and actually fall in love with each other. It, it was a beautiful thing. I don't know if our country will ever get there, but like you, I hope we can. That was well said, <laughs> doctor. Okay, um, where where do you, have you spoke at events? Have you spoke at events about your wonderful book? Oh yeah, in fact, uh, this next week, uh, we're talking on January 4th. On January 10th, I'll be at the National World War II Museum uh, doing a presentation of the book At First Light and a presentation about the Forgotten Front. The World War II Museum names its top books every year, his, history books on the war. This is much more than just a history book. It's a book of, of many, many, many stories. It's, a, it's like reading a novel. It's a page turner. It reads very, very quickly, uh, but has a lot of historical information. So I'll be there. I've been invited to go to the National, uh, I'm, uh, I've been told I'm going to be invited to go to the National Medal of Honor uh, Heritage Center in Chattanooga. I was just up at the, Tennessee. Yeah, at Chattanooga. Ah! And then I, I, I just was up in uh, Pennsylvania at the Army Heritage Education Center and the Army War College, talking about the Forgotten Front. Um, oh, and like and, and and hosts like you around the country. I just got off off uh, um, a a presentation with uh, Talk Radio Europe, uh, talking uh, to people all over Europe, and then hosts like you who have been so gracious to invite me to come on, because there's so many books printed every year, and how do you know what to read? And my prayer is that people who read At First Light will fall in love with history. They'll see the humanity of those who fought and sacrificed for us, and then be able to look inside to say, well, how does knowing this information of the past affect me now and, and in the future? How can it change me? And the letters that I get and the emails that I get and the people who write me on Facebook and Instagram who talk about how reading this book has changed them has made it worth every minute of the 16 years of research and writing until it finally saw the light of day. No pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and you, you did. Okay, so how can the people like reach you on Facebook? That well, it's just name. Walt Laramore at, at Facebook, also on Twitter and Instagram. Um, the book is available at anywhere that you buy books, particularly on online. When I was looking yesterday, Amazon and Target had the lowest price on the book, but sometimes that that changes. So whatever your online. Uh, book story is you can have the book delivered uh to your to your home or even to loved ones um i just had two emails this morning from people who after they finished it wrote one of them said i'm sending it to five of my my family members another one said i'm sending it to six of of my friends of people who i think need to to read this wonderful heart-rending story um i think you know you mentioned all the stories the one the book is a true World War, the subtitle of At First Light is a true World War II story of of, of bravery and of an amazing horse. And uh, so the amazing horse part of the story is when he went into, uh, flew 200 miles in a Piper Cub, landed in a clearing, uh, almost, almost crashing, but then a Nazi that showing him the horses. He actually rode on a on a thoroughbred, a championship thoroughbred horse that wasn't a don't pure they thoroughbred. don't they run around in that like on in a little speedway or something. I don't know. No, horse they, race. They did. He rode this thoroughbred horse that had been a champion uh, and, and actually rode it to the farm and then raced to the Nazi vet who was riding a Lipizzan on a steeplechase course. But uh uh, the, the horse wasn't a purebred. It was a seven-eighths thoroughbred. And the Nazi soldier, the Nazi veterinarian, told him that that horse was scheduled to be put down, to be euthanized because it wasn't pure, you see? And so, Dad, that just broke his heart that this wonderful creature was going to be put down. Well, after he got out, after, he, after the news went up to General Patton, 
that the horses were there. And after they were rescued, dad lost his leg three days later and was sent home. But General Patton had a colonel on his staff by the name of Fountain, Colonel Fountain. Uh, he had a daughter named Marilyn. And Marilyn Fountain was my dad's fiance. Uh, she was back in the States uh, waiting for dad to come home, praying that dad would come home safely. And so when he told her about this amazing horse that he had ridden, uh, Marilyn told her father, I, I think, I do not know, but I think her father told General Patton. And General Patton not I only had, had three lipizzans sent home for himself, but he also had this thoroughbred horse sent home for dad. And after dad lost his battle to stay in the army, he was able to win the battle to keep that horse. I won't say any more because the rest of that story of his reunion with that horse, if you don't, if it doesn't bring tears to your eyes, your tear ducts are broken. And so I hope- I'm gonna try to offset. <laughs> I hope you'll not only read about the war horses, the men and women who fought in World War II, the horses that how fought- do they, How do they euthanize the horse? I just well, wanna know, because I'm going to a point. You'll actually learn about that in the book because there was a point in the war that the men had, the army had landed in southern France. It was their fifth and final D-Day. They were racing up France, chasing the German army through a small gap called the Thales Gap. It was a gap in the mountains that was only wide enough for a two-lane road, a river, and a rail track. And the Americans got in, in front of the German army and set up a pincher to ambush the Germans. And there were tens of thousands of Germans, of vehicles, of trains hauling out munitions. And most of our listeners and viewers won't know this, but the German army was predominantly a horse-drawn army. Almost all of their artillery wasn't mechanized. It was pulled by horses. And at one point, the German army was losing five to 6,000 horses a month. And so when okay, they- Okay, that leads me to my next question, because how, how, how do you, like, exactly how, because we see, <laughs> we see that in the United States, they talk about horse power. I don't know if they say the same thing in different languages, overseas, wherever cars are dispersed, which is everywhere. Yeah. So I just mm -hmm. wanted to know why do they, what do they do with these horses that is so special? Is something about their power. What well, is, they are powerful, but in this gap, many, many of those horses, along with many of the soldiers were killed and many more were wounded. And because dad was an equestrian, he had to, had to round up a group of, of soldiers, including his best friend, all of whom were kind of cowboys, all of whom grew up with horses, all of whom were, were, were country boys and had ridden horses. He gathered up a group of these, of these men and they went in to find the wounded horses and they had to determine which would live and which would be put down. And many of the horses were too, too wounded to live. And so Dad had to instruct the men how to put down those horses. Uh, how did you shoot them so that that the the bullet would immediately immediately uh, kill the horse with no pain, with no struggle, um, with with no hurt? How do you put down a horse? And so there's a chapter of the book uh, that talks about about that. Um, it's difficult to read, but it's important to to see the humanity uh, that Dad and the men had for these these remarkable, powerful creatures, and they the ones they could save they rounded up and they 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 had an old cowboy roundup. They rounded up all those horses and they herded them back behind the front where they were able to feed them and care for them and begin the healing process of adopting those horses into French families. It's a it's a special story in the book. Do you believe in um, spiritual um, transference? Which is like, if I, if I was to say something to you very, very mean, that would be me transferring my negativity to you. But spiritual transference is something that I believe some, I just added spiritual to the transference. But let me get to the point. So I believe it means that 
you can spiritually connect with somebody and when they pass away their spirit sort of like leaves their body but you know um i i feel so bad for those horses you know um at least the military have a voice for those horses and that's so all i can they did. say well, he he had an ability as a very young child for example on his um uh, if I remember right, it was his sixth birthday. He grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, and there's a famous hotel. It's still there called the Peabody Hotel or the Peabody Hotel, and it's known for its lobby where there's a fountain, and in that fountain every day uh, in the morning, I think it's at 8 a.m., a group of ducks, the Peabody Mallards, are brought down from the their suite at the top of the Peabody Hotel. And they come down an elevator and they have a duck master who's dressed in a uniform. And he herds the ducks from the elevator to the uh, to the fountain on a red carpet. And dozens and dozens and dozens, maybe hundreds of tourists will gather to watch the duck walk every day as these ducks waddle into the into the fountain. They swim there all day, greeting tourists. And then at the end of the day, the duck master comes and walks them out of the fountain across the the uh, uh, the red carpet and up the elevator. Well, dad had a reputation among his friends. His, his mom took him to his sixth birthday there. And all his friends talked about dad being a dog whisperer or a cat whisperer or a horse whisperer because any creature that he took care of he had a way of communicating with him. Uh, it was facial grimacing or, or, or facial expression. It was sounds that he made and they would respond. And so they were at this birthday party. They were sitting behind a rope. The ducks were coming down the red carpet. And one of dad's friends said, <laughs> can you talk to the ducks? And dad shook his head and he started making visual contact with the ducks. He started making these sounds. And this one mallard, and the, and the five females all turned off the carpet and walked to sit on his lap. Figure that out. Then his mom takes him on his, I believe, ninth birthday. The Lipizzan stallions actually came to the U.S. and were touring. And they were doing a show in the Mid-South Coliseum in Memphis. And so dad went the day before the performance to, to spend time with the Lipizzans, just shoveling manure and brushing them. And one of the writers really fell in love with Dad, really developed a little relationship with him, and actually let him sit on a Lipizzan, which the, the writers don't even sit on the Lipizzans until they've been in training for six years. I mean, it's only kings and queens ride on Lipizzans. Only writers that have been trained for decades sit on Lipizzans. But the reason he did was Dad had a way of communicating. And, and this experienced head writer saw dad talking with horses he had, had never met. A stableman, dad was a juvenile delinquent growing up. His, he was a latchkey child. His mom and dad both worked. His dad traveled on, on, on trains. He was a conductor, and so he was gone days at a time. His mom worked long days as a paralegal in a law office. So dad was a latchkey kid. He got in trouble all the time. That's why he got sent to military school in high school because he was such a bad kid. But where he found himself was two areas. One is, is a Boy Scout being outdoors and riding horses outdoors on, on family members' farms in northern Arkansas. And the other was going to work at a stable, the horses that drew the trolleys in Memphis. He would go take care of those horses. And the stablemen would tell my grandma, He's got something special with his communication. I think that was more than just mind and emotion and will. I think there was something spiritual that that happened there with those very special creatures. So he had that ability. It carried into the war. And so there's not only these graphic, horrible war stories in the book, but there's stories of war horses that he met in Morocco with the Berber horses. And then in, in Italy, with the, the Napoli's, the, the dressage horses. Then Can I ask you something? I got to ask you. Okay. Okay, wow. I was, okay. So the the horses, Um, you're saying that if we talk to horses, horses understand what we're saying? I, I'm not sure that, Every horse understands every person. It's just a grade of horse. But well, like I, 
the horse I people I know say that that it can happen with all horses. I mean, one of our, our most best loved movies here in America, Robert Redford played in a horse called the Horse Whisperer. And there's some people that seem to have an innate intuitive ability to communicate with creatures in ways that many of us cannot. And yet, I, I never was an equestrian myself, but the questions I talked to say that those relationships happen. Where I saw it in practice was the relationships that my patients develop with pets, for example. Uh, I mean, they're more than just furry friends. They're, they're creatures with whom pet owners can have a connection, can have uh, a relationship. Some of the the deepest grieving that I ever saw in my 40 years of being a family physician was people who lost, who lost pets. In fact, I had a, a guy who was a veteran of D-Day. He, he had paratrooped. He was with the 82nd Airborne. He parachuted. How was that? Where is that at? I was at 82nd Airborne. Where you? Well, he, 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 my, my dad was also in the 82nd Airborne initially until uh, part of the, the, he was in a glider division in the 82nd, and then the glider division was taken out. So he would have been with the 82nd Airborne in Europe, but he wasn't. He was with the 3rd Infantry Division. But anyway, Jerry was with the 82nd Airborne in, in World War II, parachuted into D-Day. And I had the privilege of taking care of him for the last 10 or so years of his life. But he started coming to me with all sorts of weird symptoms. He couldn't sleep well. He was feeling depressed. He was having stomach symptoms. He was having heart symptoms. Test after test after test. We couldn't find out what was wrong with him. And finally, after six months, I just st sat down with him. And I probably should have done this six months earlier. But I said, Jerry, anything happened six months ago? Anything? When all this began, was there anything particular that happened? And his eyes teared up and he said, "That's the I lost my dog. I lost my companion, my buddy, uh, six months ago. And it turns out he was just grieving the loss of that special friend and so then the the therapy once you're in sync once you're in sync with an animal it's like you know the animal the animal knows you and your spirit people don't understand and i, I what is the symbolic symbolism of a horse what is symbolic not about you know, I, and then we have to end okay <laughs> well i think it's different to each horseman and it's different to each dog owner. It's different to each cat owner and reptile owner. But I see them as part of God's special creation given to us as a gift to steward, just as is just as our, our relationships, our families, our country, our government, our land are all gifts. I think that the creator has given to us to steward. And I think that thread is, is in this book. It's not a, a spiritual book in that sense. But it's a book of stories, of human and animal stories that connect at the heart level. And I hope serve as an encouragement, as a stimulation for each of us to consider how can we walk better? How can we steward the gifts that we have? How can we use difficulties, obstacles, uh, not to become more broken, to become more resilient, uh, not to have harder hearts, but to have softer hearts, not to see uh, the difficulties as as uh, as imposts, but rather as signposts for our journey through life. How can we, as the chaplain said, not become more bitter, but become better by connecting with others who are on the same or similar journeys? And that's what you do with your show. Uh, you know, the little bit I've read about, can I call it the ministry that you have in media of helping connect people with people in such a way that we all become better people? Thank you so very much. Um, stay on the line. Um, you guys take care. Be safe out there. And I will see you later.